Hey guys, what's up? Alright, so this is a video that I'm actually pretty excited about because in a weird way it marks the first step of a really major change that's coming. So there's, there's something big coming that I can't necessarily talk too much about yet. Um, and you know, I can't really give you guys any timelines or anything like that, but something, something very juicy. Um, and one of the, well, I can, well, I can tell you part of what it involves is major site revamps and additional features. And one such feature is a sort of like difficulty knob for deck tiering. Now, what does that mean? Well, there's a lot of decks in the game that have really low win rates, but, uh, are really good decks if they're played very well. Karma Ezreal being kind of like the poster child of this. And you'll see that in like, if you go to the meta stats, you know, you go to Karma Ezreal, you know, we're at all ranks and it's terrible. It's like 52% here. It kind of never really gets above 52%, right? When you look at all ranks. So you're like, wow, it's a hard deck to play. So it must be better in Masters, right? Nope. Not really. I mean, this this data point is slightly better. This one's a lot worse. For the most part, it's pretty much the same. Maybe even a little bit worse. So what's going on? You know, how how can it not even be better in Masters if I say this deck is hard? When I say this deck is hard to play, uh, there's probably like 50 people in Runeterra that can actually play Karma Ezreal very, like, well enough for it to be a tier 1 deck. Like a really, really low number of people. Um, it's a super hard deck. It's definitely the hardest deck in the game. And... That puts me into a little bit of a dilemma because you know when I'm making my tier list, both on my own my own site as well as the one on you know the Mobilitics meta tier list, you know we're discussing we're like man Karma Ezreal it's such a good deck but you really have to know how to play it for it to be good so what do we do? Well the only answer is having kind of like a sort of difficulty uh, sort of dial which is like a standardized way to express this deck is. Uh, you know, will be tier X if you're at this level, and tier Y if you're at this level. Like, something that doesn't just say, because, you know, my site does have difficulty, but something that is actually, like, you know, defined uh, with, like, numbers in a metric, right? Something that can actually be expressed and even, like, demonstrated in the stats to some degree. This is a video where we are going to be breaking down uh, at least, at least, you know, as much as we can in one video for uh, a few... Uh, for, for a few games, the intricacies of Karma Ezreal. Now, to do this, we're gonna have to take the tournament deck that, you know, I made and basically make it into a ladder version. Now, this was a request I got from a lot of people because um, we placed in first place in the top seed for the Twitch Rivals two days ago, and a lot of people were like, some, you know, make deck guides for the decks. For the other two decks, I probably won't make specific deck guides for. I might revisit that later in some other fashion. But Karma Ezreal is actually an archetype that I think I have made a deck guide for it months ago in a completely different meta when the deck played very differently. But it's a deck that I have wanted to make a deck guide for uh, specifically because it's so hard and even building it, I, I would say that most versions I see on ladder are pretty poorly built for what the deck wants to do. So let me go ahead and take this tournament version. I talked a lot about, you know, in, in a video I made on this channel just a couple days ago, I talked about why this version is entirely built around this tournament format and that I wouldn't recommend this version for ladder. So let's go ahead and, well, ladderize this version. So we're gonna go ahead and cut the some of the anti-aggro tools. Those are gonna be the gotchas, the third rummage, the chump wump, and the two denies both of them. Deny, weirdly enough, in this current meta is an anti-aggro tool because most of what it's hitting is stuff like Harrowing and Relentless Pursuit, which is, yeah, pretty different from how you would expect that card to be in a normal meta, right? We're gonna add in Shadow Assassin. The most insane thing about the deck is that it was running zero Shadow Assassin, which is why it's called Mav is a genius, because it's a crazy idea, but it made sense. It made perfect, perfect sense, given the exact like nature of the tournament. And this is gonna be our deck for the time being. Now, I will probably come back to this and make some modifications, you know, here and there, but this is like pretty much what I would be running on ladder right now. Um, I will be updating my website on, of course, the Meta Monday with my refined ladder version and be updating as it goes. So if you wanna play Karma Ezreal, 
I would highly recommend going to the pinned comment, there's a link to the site, or there's going to be a permanently updated version of Karma Ezreal. As much as I'd like to be able to update it in this video, it's I can't really do that, so if you want an updated version of the deck you're looking at right now, it's probably going to be a couple of cards updated if you check it out on the link there. Okay. So, for the time being, let's go ahead and show you guys how this deck works, why it's so hard, and how you're playing it wrong if you're even trying to play it at all. Okay, so jump cut to obviously a completely different day of recording. Uh, and I have effectively decided that the best way to do this is to just kind of like watch my own games in the Twitch Rivals tournament uh, where we played the Karma Ezreal deck because I think there's a lot to break down in terms of how these specific games played out. Now, this is going to end up somewhat of a sort of a version independent playing guide. We're not gonna talk too much about like the specific cards in question. We are just going to be talking about how to play the deck and how different positions need to play out. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and get into the game and this is gonna be a ben against BBG's Demacia deck. So <clears throat> this is a pretty standard Bannerman deck. It's using Garen and Zed, but it's, you know, pretty standard in kind of every other way. Usually you'll see like Quinn or Lucian and then like a Misfortune or Callista in that have said, but apart from that, it's going to run kind of all the same cards you'd expect. Now, it's pretty close between a mid range and an aggro deck. So, what's our game plan? What are we going to do? Well, our game plan is basically just to stay alive. So, normally, we just want to find our early game cards claws, eyes, any spells that are going to hit things. Because of the matchup, we're going to go ahead and keep the Ezreals too. Uh, and this is just because against Demacia, the most important thing is just killing off their units and making sure that their stuff that buffs their entire board doesn't function, right? So keeping the Ezreal here is going to be key. Uh, against like something like a Basil Scrider, you would never, ever, ever keep Ezreal. We draw the Gotra on turn one, which is pretty sad. You, uh, you hate to see the mana discount on turn one from Gotra. And we'll just go ahead and start these passes. Now... This is rule number one of playing Karma Ezreal. If you're going to take one thing from this video, let it be literally this. I'm going to say this. Most important thing. Let this burn into your brain. When in doubt, just pass. It's that simple. When you have a play, just pass instead. Now, I'm going to give this a really big asterisk. You should always ask yourself, okay, if I pass here, if my opponent also passes and forces us out of the round, do I mind that? Right? And in the case of whenever you're playing against any kind of aggressive deck at all, the answer is pretty much always no. Pretty much always no. And the reason we do this is really, really important. You look at my hand, I want to play an Eye of the Dragon here, right? But what if he plays War Chefs? Well, then I would really rather Thermo Beam. So even though, even though I want to do a play here, I need to pass first. So we open pass. We make sure we're playing for reactivity and we're thinking about it, okay? You should do this on almost all of your turns. I know it probably sounds like some nitty gritty min maxing thing. This, if you do this simple thing, you, you will see a huge impact in your win rate in these games. It is not a small thing. This will change the outcome of a ton of different games because if every single turn you get to choose which spell to play based on the information of what they've played on that turn, that changes everything. He's going to play a Zed on turn three, and I'm going to immediately slam it with a gotcha. I'm going to need to do this because, of course, if the Zed attacks, then, you know, we get pretty shafted by the clone that we can't stop. Now, we're not sad about having to overkill the Zed. And in fact, if I had a Mystic Shot in my hand, I, I might have still used the Gotcha. Because one really, really important thing in this matchup is we need to be playing around Ranger's Resolve. We never want to let Ranger's Resolve get value, right? Ever. So, I could Thermal Beam the Bird, but... We're going to go ahead and take stock of this hand, right? Thermal Beaming the Bird looks pretty good there because it's the second spell we need for the Salamander off the Eye of the Dragon. And, you know, Claws of the Dragon is coming out. And if he Rangers Resolves, he's only saving one unit, so that's okay. But looking at this hand, we've got a second Eye of the Dragon that we also want to be enabling. And most importantly, we've got Ezreal. Ezreal's going to have Mystic Shots. And Thermo Beam will get value later, right? We Thermo Beam is our only way of stopping something big. We don't have any palms or wills. Thermo Beam is the only thing in this hand that stops something big. So we look at our hand. We're planning out our next turn. The most important thing 
is if we had thermal beamed there, we wouldn't have enough mana for Ezreal Mystic Shock here. So now we make the call. Would we hate it if he passed? We wouldn't. He's the one who has to play into us. So even though we know what we're going to do, we know we're going to Ezreal and then Mystic Shot, we're going to let him make the first move. Why are we going to do that? Well, even though we, even though we already know what we're going to do, so his play isn't going to influence ours, our play could still influence his, right? Because if he has the information of knowing we're about to play Ezreal, he might play something that's a little more efficient into the Mystic Shot, right? Uh, and there's a lot of different things that could be even something like a bannerman uh, He could have decided to play there instead of the warships if he knew we were about to pick off one of his units, right? So I can't stress this enough. This is like the number one rule in this video Just pass, but you always have to ask yourself would I be okay if the opponent passed back for the most part? This can often stop being true after turn like six or seven or so, right? It's more like an early mid game thing Okay so we're going to get our free Mystic Shot in our hand, and we're going to choose whether to use it on Bird or Scythria. It's an easy choice of Bird, I think. We really want to make sure Ranger's Resolve is just truly getting no value. And, of course, the Bird is representing a major threat. It does have the ability to, you know, shoot, uh, to kind of like attack down Ezreal or some target that we might want to stop. So the only sad thing about this is we're not triggering any of our, like, Dragon cards. Um, but that's fine. We're not in a hurry. So he plays Garen. Now this gives us... A truly juicy thermo beam, but an insanely risky one. Insanely risky to thermo beam this, because if we thermo beam the Garen, and he has Ranger's Resolve, we're gonna be incredibly sad. We'll be completely out of mana, completely out of options, and no way to finish him off. That's no good, right? So we've got to think what we're doing here instead. We do kind of want to play two spells if possible, um, and we can do that with like Eye and Thermo. We could do a Mystic Shot and the Small Thermo here on the War Chefs. That's an option as well. Um, it really depends on what he's going to do. The biggest thing is we just want to have Chump Blockers, right? Demacia's biggest weakness is they can't deal damage over the top. They don't have Overwhelm, they don't have Elusives, and they don't have direct damage from spells. They're entirely reliant on blockable sources of damage, right? So, we're going to start off simple. We're going to go ahead and play an Eye of the Dragon. This gives us a blocker. And then, you know, we've got our Mystic Shot that we can potentially use from hand. Um, but letting this resolve first is better because, of course, you know, if it's Ranger's resolve, we want to be able to deal at least a little bit of damage coming through, right? So, we're a little bit worried about Ranger's resolve. Relentless Pursuit is on our minds. We do want to play a couple of spells here. We really need to get both Salamanders coming out. But we're not really in that much of a hurry, right? So we're going to go ahead and use our Mystic Shot. It's Ezreal's Mystic Shot, but that doesn't matter in this matchup. In a controlly matchup, you'd potentially be really scared of using your other copies of Ezreal really loosely. And he's going to go ahead and Relentless Pursuit. Now, this looks kind of scary because he's getting the next action, which means he, he'll be able to attack us before we can Thermo Beam and get our Claws, which looks kind of nasty, right? So what would you do here? You're about to play a second spell. That's going to summon your Salamanders and get your Claws out. Demacia is staring you down. They're about to deal 8 damage. And your blockers aren't looking so hot, right? So, it looks like a bad spot. What if I were to tell you... And by the way, the, the Twitch chat for the Twitch rivals... At this exact moment, they're, they're literally all spamming like... GG BBG1. What if I were to tell you that... We have basically won this game already. And both players know it. Like, BBG knows he can't really win here. And it's a very, very simple play in this position as well. What would you do here? So, the very, very easy play we're going to make uh, effectively just involves taking the damage. We're not going to do anything else. Because Demacia has no way to deal damage, right? They rely on unit combat. We have a train of salamanders coming out, and we have enough tools to keep playing, keep spamming spells, and level our Ezreal forever. We've got a bit of lifesteal left of the salamanders. We're, like, all of our top decks are going to be drawing us into targets or more draws. So, if our draws are really, really bad, we could lose. But for the most part, we're, we're in complete control here, and... There's not really much he can do, right? Demacia is sort of like, in a way, too fair of a region. Now, 
Demacia, old Demacia had some answers to this kind of board state. That was big Scythria. But new Demacia plays Genevieve instead. And Genevieve can't really do anything here, right? You would need something like a big Scythria to get through board states like this because she gives everything fearsome. So I'm going to get a bit of lifesteal with my Salamanders. I'm going to start getting some free targets. Let's take stock of this hand. We've got a Mystic Shot and we've got a Thermo Beam. So we could Mystic Shot, you know, the... We, we, we've got a lot of plays here. We've also got the Static Shock, right? So what would you do here? We've got six mana. A 6-3 and a 2-1. Mystic, Static, and Thermo Beam. Well, the answer here is actually really, really easy. You just want to kill both of the opponent's units, right? So we're always, always going to Mystic Shot the Scythria, not the Garen. Do not be greedy. If we try to use the Static Shock here, we will lose the game to Ranger's Resolve. We don't have to lose to Ranger's Resolve. We can play around it. Right? We're in a dominant position. Very dominant. You want to take risks when you're behind, not ahead. We can kill off both of his cards on board without losing to Rangers is all. So there's no need to. We'll Thermo Beam the Garen. And we're going to go ahead, get our Ezreal levels, summon more Salamanders. And as you can see, there's just nothing his deck can really do in this position. He'll end up playing another Garen. So, yeah, I mean, he's got a bunch more attacks, but it's not. It's never. he's never going to have a way through my board, right? I've got my two eyes. I'm in a completely dominant position. So we've even got our Static Shock here. Um, we've got the Ezreal that's, I think, about to level. I actually don't remember exactly what his triggers are at this point. I think he's he's right about to level up, right? So, you know, we're deciding if we would rather play Chump uh, as a blocker or maybe, like, keep Static Shock alive as an option. He doesn't have a War Chef, so we can't kill our Ezreal, which is pretty important here because we did have to use the second Ezreal as a Mystic Shot. Whereas, like, if he did have, like, something like a War Chef to threaten the Ezreal, that could be a little nasty. We did draw, like, third Ezreal as the Mystic Shot. He's going to go ahead and pass here, and we're just going to go ahead and pass back, right? I think that's what we're about to do anyway. Because it, it doesn't really matter, like, too much what else we do. You know, he's realizing against this, like, Salamander-heavy board, he literally can't attack anyway. There's, just, like, nothing he can do. And we're pretty much going to kill him, like, almost next turn. So we can start using these Eye of the Dragons as chump blockers, right? We don't actually need to really keep these anymore. They've kind of done their job already. We can maybe keep them for one more turn, depending. But our Ezreal is 6 out of 8. So we want to level up the Ezreal and, you know, make sure that we're threatening some units at the same time. Uh, we do have to target two of his units because we need the Ezreal triggers. So we're just going to declare our attack while we do the Static Shock. Now, it's pretty likely he'll be on a Ranger's Resolve. I believe it's a 3 of in his deck. And given his range, that means Ranger's Resolve is about, from my perspective, uh, about a 70% chance of being in his hand because we've been bricking it every step of the way, right? So he had the resolve, but it doesn't matter anymore. His board no longer matters. My Ezreal is leveled up and I've got blockers for anything he could do, right? So there's just nothing about that resolve that I mind at this point of the game. So I have no problem playing it in a way that makes it, you know, potentially blocked. Um, uh, playing the Static Shock in the way that makes the resolve potentially blocked. And it's gonna be a pretty simple closeout from here, right? Kind of like, Everything you'd expect, I'm just going to do kind of like a block, shoot him in the face a couple of times. I'm taking like 20 seconds just to kind of like make sure that I'm not having any like weird brain moments, you know, because it's it's a tournament and I want, I don't, you, you're, you'd be so embarrassed if you lost a tournament, like a big tournament to like any sort of weird brain moment. So you want to be like extra careful in these kinds of positions. But, uh, but yeah, we're good here and we're just going to go ahead and... Um, Take this one away. So, it's very, very simple. A couple of things. First step, just pass. Like, really. Like, I promise it's it'll make such a big deal. You'll win so many games off this, and you won't even notice. Like, it's so, it's so subtle, but it's so impactful. It really is, okay? Like, these passes and just these reactive plays, you just get to play with more information, right? You know? You, your, your opponent plays their unit, and you get to play your spell and you, you just choose a smarter decision because you know what their play is, right? And vice versa, well, not vice versa, but on the contrary, not on the contrary, but on, in addition to that, not only are you getting a smarter play because they have to go first and you get to respond to it, 
but your opponent is forced into a weaker play because they don't get to respond to your play, right? It's sort of like double-sided. You're, you're getting both benefits at once. The second thing we learned is that health is a resource, right? You shouldn't be afraid of blocking or, or of not blocking, of taking too much damage. When you're thinking about blocking, you have one question to ask. Will this unit potentially get more value in the future just by staying alive, right? Or should I just trade it off like this? This is the idea of chump blocking, right? And in that case, the answer is simple. Yeah, my Eye of the Dragons, that, that one time we didn't block and went down to 2 health, my Eye of the Dragons will get more value than this. Like, at the end of the day, he can't deal this 2 damage ever. We're just going to chill, heal it back up a little bit, chump it down a little bit more. It's an easy answer. Against Basilisk Griders, sometimes you have to take really aggressive blocks really early. Sometimes I need to use a 2-2 unit to block, to chump out a Draven on like turn 4. Because sometimes, in reality, my blocker won't ever get higher value than saving me 3 health in that matchup. Because they have a lot of overwhelms and they don't really care about your blockers, right? So there, you might have to make some difficult decisions. So just ask yourself that one question. Will my blocker, you know, could I, should I throw it away here? Or if I play the few turns out in my head, will it get higher value? Okay, let's go next game against Casanova. Now, we're kind of starting off more basic. I'm showing you guys another Demacia game. Demacia is sort of like, you know, it's a very, very basic deck. It's sort of like the most, like, sort of fundamental to the rules of the game. We're obviously going to mulligan our entire hand there. Karma, you never want to keep Karma except against, like, the Mirror. Um, or maybe, like, a control matchup like Shadow Isles, you could keep Karma. And Chumpwump is alright, but non-essential. He's pretty good stabilizer against, like, a lot of the matchups. Against Basilisk Rider, you love playing him on turn 4, you can block the Rider, you know. He's fine, but we've got three Chumpwumps in this version of the deck, so I'll find one later. We really just want our early stabilizers. We're looking for Eye, Claw... You know, Mystic Shot, Thermal Beam, Ezreal. Those are kind of our five cards. Static is all right, but mostly we're just worried about Ranger's Resolve, so we're going to have to use it very timidly. Okay. Now, Cass is running basically the same deck, although, interestingly enough, completely different champions. He's running Quinn and Callista instead of Zed and Garen. The deck's going to play out almost identically, but just the champion slots are changed. So, he's got War Chefs and Fleet Feather Tracker, and we're thinking about whether we would Mystic Shot, Mystic Shot, the Fleet Feather Tracker, or just maybe tank it? Because we can't really do anything else this turn. Okay, what would you guys do here? So I actually, I thought long and hard about this decision. This is actually a bit of a tough one. And I, I came to my answer in a very, very simple way. I asked myself what my good friend Rattling Bones would do. Rattling Bones is a super smart guy. He plays a lot of a lot of Ezreal Karma. And he coached me a little bit before the tournament since I didn't play quite as much of this deck. Um, and the answer is, I think he would pass here. And it's just as simple as we're about to play Ezreal. Unlike last game, we're attacking on turn three. And we really, really, really want to use his fleeting Mystic Shot. We're okay taking a bit of damage. Like last game, keep in mind health is a resource. It's okay to lose a little bit when you have a high amount, right? Um, and it's this matchup in particular, it's perfectly fine taking more health damage than normal because that's the thing about Demacia and that's what makes them a kind of weak. They can't really punish low health. They can't close out games. So I'm safe going to low health against them, no matter what their hand is. A couple of choices here. You can use it on Tracker or Cythria. Same as last game, we're going to play around Resolve by using it on Tracker. Now, that might sound like I'm afraid of him using Resolve this turn, and it's not. In reality, if I'm only going to use Mystic Shot, the Tracker is just the bigger threat anyway. It's just the better card. Whereas, playing what playing around Ranger's Resolve really means is realizing that I can't really use this Static Shock in my hand. I'm kind of too scared to use the Static Shock, because it just gives them so much tempo. Like, they, they can rush... If I waste four mana doing nothing, they'll rush down the game. And that's really bad for me. So I can't do that. I could this turn, because they're at zero mana, but they don't have a board for it. So I draw the two mana gotcha, like any good player always would here. And that's great. That's super amazing. 
and I don't mind playing into a resolve because he's at zero mana. Now, if he wasn't at, if he was at one mana, I would take the Gotcha on the Warshafts first, and then if he resolves, then I would have to Mystic Shot the Warshafts too, probably. But because he's at zero, I can just use both actions at once, and that allows me to have this 3-2 as a blocker. Okay? So now, we need to be asking ourselves, okay, we got this 3-1 Grizzly Ranger, what are we going to do about it here? Uh, well, we're not going to trade off Ezreal, he's too valuable, they really don't have good ways of killing him. Unless they use, like, the Warshaft's fleet for the tracker, which you've seen, I've denied in both of these games, right? You really have to not let them get a free kill on your Ezreal. And if they don't have that, you can just kind of chill, right? There's not too much to worry about here. He's actually neglecting to attack with his 2-2 Scythria, which I'm perfectly fine with. I uh, might have done, like, an interesting block with Ezreal or something if he did attack. I was actually a little bit surprised here. I expected Casanova to attack with a 2-2 Scythria. And I'm pretty much just going to let this through, right? Blocking the Grizzly Ranger doesn't really do anything because it just turns into the 3-4 later. And we're just chilling. We're just in chill mode, right? Same as last game. So he's at 5 mana. And, you know, we want to see what he does first, right? Now, when I say you should pass to see what your opponent does, you can also attack. Right? They're kind of the same thing. If you have like an Ezreal or a Shadow Assassin on board, this, this deck doesn't really need to take attacks. You don't need your units attacking, right? So taking an attack and passing are kind of the same thing if your opponent can't really block effectively. Like when they have an, o an empty board and you've got an Eye of the Dragon, instead of skipping your turn by passing, skip your turn by attacking. Get that one damage in. Why not? Or Ezreal, because, you know, you're going to attack with Ezreal either way. But now what I've accomplished is I've given him back action. He has to act now, or risk getting locked out of the round. If he passes now, if he tries to be cheeky, if I wanted to, I could just pass back and burn his mana. If both players are burning mana, that this benefits the control player. I want games to go long, I want mana to be burned. And that is such an important realization, not just in Ezreal Karma, but any control deck. It's so, so, so important to realize that. Because... You just want reactivity on all your plays, right? So we'll trade the Ranger's Resolve for the Fleeting Mystic Shot. I'm quite happy with this. You know, our card is fleeting. It's kind of the only thing it really can do. It's not a great Ranger's Resolve. He's only saving one unit. And we're going to just, like, play the Chump Pump anyway. So again, in this situation, we're feeling pretty good. We've got the hand we need. We've got a nice safety card in Will of Ionia, which is great if you play something scary like Genevieve. Oh, hello there. Look at that. And that's a potential threat to Ezreal. So we're pretty much going to get rid of that. We're pretty much just not having that Genevieve there. Because in this case, it's sometimes okay letting your Ezreal die. But there's just no reason to in this case, right? Like Ezreal is just going to be a threat. It's going to put this game on a real clock. Because we just it's so easy to level up. Eight targets is really nothing, right? Especially since while we're targeting, we're also slowing down the game. So let's just send this Genevieve back. He'll get to use her battle cry again, but like two turns from now, this game is going to be over. The, like two turns is so long from now. That's just a problem for the future, right? And I like it won't even be a problem at that point in time. Okay, so we can go ahead and take this block. Um, and we've got, you know, the free Mystic Shot as well on the 4-2. It doesn't really matter when we use this for that two mana. It's never going to make a difference like which action we put this on. And as you can see now, we've got a 4-3 to block his 3-4. Now, he does what I would consider a bad attack here. I'm very confident he was supposed to attack with both units. I don't know if it matters at this point, um, but Cass has actually held back a lot of attacks. Um, and as the aggressive player, you really want to be getting in more attacks than that. Right? You shouldn't, you shouldn't be worried about like these value trades when you should just be getting in your damage while you can. Okay. So, we're going to get in this other, like, fleeting draw with Ezreal. And at this point, I mean, we're looking pretty great. We might not be able to gotcha this turn, right? Um, and that's okay. You shouldn't, like, always think about the mana and how valuable it is. Like, when you look at this hand, we don't necessarily need a lot of mana, right? So, it's kind of not necessarily a bad thing to not be able to gotcha this turn. We'll see. We could also Static Shock and gotcha instead of the Mystic Shot as well if we decided to. Uh, that's kind of up to us. 
We're gonna go ahead and open with Static Shock. We know we need the Ezreal triggers anyway. And if he has a Ranger's Resolve, he kind of would have to use it there. So he really can't have the Ranger's Resolve. That's really nice, right? Because it would be, you know, now we can think about using Gotcha instead of Mystic Shot if we want to. I think that's perfectly fine. I've actually realized that I'm kind of covering up my old webcam. I'm just gonna go over to this top corner so you guys can kind of like see my expression during these games. I should have done this earlier, it just makes sense. But, hello down there, past swim. Anyway, he's he's doing this thing with his cards. He, he always just like, he's, he's very hesitant, so he just does this like thing where he just covers his mouth with his deck. And uh, this is how you can tell he's like deep in thought. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and use our um, gotcha in this case instead of the mystic shot and this is partially just because like it's you know the safer play but a lot of it is just because he played Callista um, and Callista could potentially be like slightly scary of a card really we need to make sure we're surviving one more attack luckily for us we drew two concussive palms like any good player would here so I mean surviving this attack isn't gonna be hard at all Palm is a pretty neat card. Pretty good stuff. So yeah, I mean, we're totally good to clean house here. Again, you can see the game is closed out. Again, Demacia just doesn't really have good ways to end the game. So we can just chill. Like, we're just not in any hurry to do anything weird at all, right? And now we've got our Ezreal. Attacking with this Ezreal is already six damage, right? Because it's the two on the attack, the two on the mystic, and then the two on the proc. So he's down to five. And then a couple of buttons from our hand and we're good. We even have the nice safety card of Deny. Which is good because his scare card is Relentless Pursuit, right? Think about it like that. Now, we have a couple of answers to Relentless. But always, when you're, when you're ahead, you know, when you're feeling good, you gotta be thinking, what's their scare card? What's their card that they could have that could make us not good? And there's always usually, like, one card that's, like, could actually turn the tables. For the past several turns, that's been Relentless Pursuit. And Drawing Deny is the safety card to that to that scare card, right? So it helps us kind of like play more of the like value game. Whereas normally when you're ahead, you have to play assuming the opponent has the scare card, which can sometimes lower your like value output per play to even dangerous levels. Safety card is a great way to alleviate that. When you've got your safety card, you're just chilling, and you can just play your value plays, because there's no scare card when you've got your safety card against it, right? Okay, so, again, we're just on the closeout here. This is a pretty easy one, nothing he can do. And it's not even close. Even if he had, like, ten more health, we would actually usually win here off of Ezreal. Like, it's not even his turn to attack, so we've got the last draw with, like, a couple more plays, plus plus whatever we're drawing off of Rummage, we probably didn't need to die. So, again, a game that didn't end up very close at all. So, you'll see in that game, like, a lot of the themes are repeating. Make sure you're taking these passes, make sure you're playing around things in their hands, but just be reactive and play safe. Respect their options. Respect stuff like Rangers Resolve, especially when you can, and that's usually always, because the game, when you're playing a powerful control deck, the game is so much in your control, right? Like, when you're playing a well-built one, you always have options, you always have decision points that always matter. So you can afford to play around things much more than you normally can. And you should definitely take advantage of that. Okay, third game. I'm gonna show you guys my game against BBG's uh, Sejuani Misfortune deck. If you guys remember the tournament, you guys will know this is a game where I did a couple of major misplays and we're gonna go ahead and talk about them because these are things that you know are very very important to to play right uh, and, you know we made some good plays but ultimately we lost this game entirely off the back of our own misplays so definitely great to examine this let's get into it so Misfortune Sejuani, he's playing a deck that basically has no spells he's using warning shot and fury of the north and of course, Sejuani's Fury of the North. And if he draws two Misfortunes, then he's got Make It Rain. What this means is he kind of has no reactive potential. We can play very safe, like he's a very face-up strategy. Stuff like Deny will be useless. 
Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and keep this entire opening hand. Let's go ahead and talk about this and why we did this. So a couple games ago, we kicked Trump Womp, but we didn't here. Why is that? Well, because we have what we call a made hand, right? I know what I want in the early stages, and because I, I already have some plays early, it's okay to keep Chump Lump. Now, this is mostly Eye of the Dragon, but even Key Guardian can be played early in this deck in a lot of situations, right? So, because of that, it's a little bit better keeping Chump Lump. In addition, the opponent is attacking on evens. You see the sword icon? I have it. That means we're attacking on odds, and they're attacking on evens. What does that mean? Well, the deck runs 3 Island Navigator. That's going to be attacking on turn 4. And Chumpwump has a beautiful stat line into Island Navigator. Makes that card feel like shit. So Chumpwump is going to be an easy keep here. Very, very easy keep. Always think about, you know, the attack turns when you're mulliganing. Think about, like, what they're going to be playing on any given turn. I'm not even sad to see a second one. Looks totally fine here. It's a little early to have Karma for my tastes. But we do have a pretty made hand. So... It's perfectly fine, nothing really too wrong about having the Karma here. Goes for the early warning shot, which is really not so bad for us. He doesn't have a great response to Eye of the Dragon here, so we've got a good stat line. This will really stop his attack. Keep in mind, his only spells are Warning Shot and Furry of the North, right? So, we're just cruising, right? Now, we can do a couple of things here, you know. We could take an open attack, threaten that one damage, um, while just kind of passing, but we... Decide not to, because Fury of the North, we don't want to lose our Eye of the Dragon for no reason. So, we'll just pass instead of, like, trying to do a weird attack. Again, we've got plays, but he can't really afford to pass back to us, right? You know? A lot of people in this position... A lot of people in, in this position here, they would look at this hand and they'd be like, Well, we can't do anything. And you know what? Not only can we not play any of our cards, we can't play Chump Lump, we can't play Vi or Karma... And we're never going to play Deny, right, Swim? We're never going to play Deny because, look, he, he, we know he has no cards in his entire deck that get denied. So we know with 100% certainty that we're going to Key Guardian this turn. And by passing Swim, all you're doing is risking not being able to Key Guardian, burning your mana. So why do it? Because there's no downside in this case. Because if he wants to get cheeky and pass back to us to burn our mana, that's good for us. Yeah, we could Key Guardian, but we would rather him waste his mana and his turn, right? We would love to burn mana here. That would be great. So we're going to pass. And again, it's just even in these situations where instinctively it feels like you shouldn't pass. Don't get me wrong. In the late game, there's plenty of situations. If your opponent has a developed board and you don't and it's the late game, you kind of can't be taking passes, right? But I'm just talking about, like, development phase. Yeah, take these passes. Even when it sort of feels like that this kind of situation where it feels like, you know, why would you pass here? It's still good. And these can still make differences in the game, right? It's like he has to play around certain threats. You know, if he passes, that's just a benefit for us. And these sorts of things will have huge impacts. So we're going to go ahead and go to turn four. We'd love to see the Island Navigator. There it is. Beautiful. So now we can get a Chump Lump. Easiest Chump Lump of our lives. He did happen to get Blade Scout, which is actually kind of annoying, because that's really, really good for him to have hit. And, of course, he had made our um, Eye of the Dragon vulnerable, so, unfortunately, our Chump Wump won't get the, the beautiful trade that it deserves. But, in this case, if we want to, we can try to Thermo Beam something. Our Chump Wump is going to be blocking something no matter what, as well. The Blade Scout is potentially a little bit annoying, and he's got a bit of a wide attack here. So we've got a couple plays. We could use a Mushroom and a Thermo on the Blade Scout. This would summon the Claws of the Dragon, which is actually kind of nice. We'd have an additional blocker. Uh, our eye is dying for free, and there's nothing we can really do about that. Or we could let it all happen. We could pass. We could use the two Mushrooms all at once and get sort of like a surprise block, depending on if he attacks into us. But there's no real reason to do that anyway. And the thing is, our eye is dying, so we're not going to get the Salamander from playing two Mushrooms. In this case, there's just no reason to do anything preemptively. And most importantly, you remember in the first game, where I was looking at our Thermo Beam and realizing, man, I've got to save this for something big, because my hand doesn't have any something big answers. Look at this hand. We don't have Palm, 
We don't have will. We kind of need a something big answer. We're going to need to be able to kill a Sejuani or something, right? So keeping this thermal beam is a little bit important. And that's going to be tip number four. Um, I asked pulled the number, by the way. I don't know how many tips I've given. I don't, I don't do this like YouTuber thing where they're like five tips, top five. And I don't know. Anyway, thermo beam. If, you know, always make sure to check, am I good against his something big play? Because they always have these, you know, Darius. Every deck has things that you want to be killing that are going to have like four to six health, right? Like pretty much always. And sometimes disabling them is enough. You don't need to kill them. Palmer will will buy this. It buys so much time when you stop a single attack on a medium-sized creature like Darius or Genevieve. Those units usually only get one attack, right? If you just stop that attack, they literally don't do anything. You can kill them before they get another attack. But if we don't have something like that, we do need to be keeping the Thermo. So we'll go ahead and drop the Vi here that we used the Key Guardian on before. Um... And just kind of like plink off a little bit of free value, right? For free, there's nothing really wrong with this. It's just like help stabilize these mid game positions a little bit when this sort of thing is happening, right? So now we've got some nice options in this hands. We've got thermal beam if we want to use it. We can start getting like clause value. So let's think about what this situation represents. What are we gonna do next turn if he open attacks? Will he open attack? Well, it's kind of hard to take a full open attack, because um, usually you really want to be developing something like Sejuani and grab something. Because, like, this Vi is a pretty good blocker, and our health isn't too low. So he likely won't open attack. Should we play for the Mushrooms this turn, or will I save them for later? It's actually a pretty close call here, but just because there's... You know, he's not really drawing cards... We could draw an eye or something that rewards us for keeping the mushrooms. He's not drawing too many cards. His health is high. The preemptive mushrooms do very, very little here. And there's kind of no reason to bust out our claws this early either. We can do it reactively towards his attack. The only reason to be mushrooming now is if we want to take a thermo. But again, we're looking at this situation and we're thinking to ourselves, man, this, this swim has like really messy hair jesus i'm just now noticing like how messy my hair is sometimes unlike me i have very very clean and very slicked back hair this guy this guy needs to get styling tips anyway um the thing is same as last turn we just realized we kind of have to keep the thermo it's just too important keeping this answer to sejuani right so he's gonna go ahead and play the five six sejuani as expected on the Vi, pretty much what he should always be doing here. We have a couple of options. We can, you know, thermo the Sejuani or potentially try to play uh, Chump Womp. Now, whenever you're playing against the Sejuani deck, keep in mind your opponent runs one card at more of a quantity than others. Most of their deck is, is three of. Fury of the North is a five of if they have Sejuani because he's got three Furies and two Sejuani. Furies in his deck right now. Crazy boosted odds. Three of odds in this kind of position on turn six are going to be a bit under 70%. When it gets to a five of, we get to like 80% 80, 80%, right? Depending on mulligans. And that's a big difference, right? It doesn't seem like it, but it's a big difference in terms of how we should think about playing around things. So a bit of a tip for Sejuani in particular, just always assume they have Fury of the North. Why does this matter here, you ask? Well, it matters here because as much as I might like to think about doing like, you know, a different play with Chumpwomp as a blocker, I have to take the opportunity to kill Sejuani while they don't have Fury mana. It's very important. This is the last time in the entire game for the entire rest of the game where they will be under four mana, right? Period. They will, they will literally never drop below four ever again, except maybe on the Rex turn if he Rexes, but by then he'll, he'll have like the Fury opportunity and it'll be too late, right? This is my last chance to get my Thermo off, so I've got to take it. Now, he's dragging my Vi, that's fine. You know, my Vi is still getting like some pretty sweet value here. And these stat line trades are a little unfortunate. 4-2 into 2-2 and 3-2 into 2-1 are not great, but they are necessary here. So, that's fine. 
overall. Not having the Ezreal yet is pretty painful. This Karma is doing, a, or sorry, this uh, Vi is doing a really, really great job of stabilizing. And for the most part, we've kind of been taking off a lot of pressure, right? We killed the first Sejuani. We're at 13 health, and we kind of still own the board too. So, we're actually just kind of fine. But we do really need to draw like Concussive Palm or Will. Um, or maybe Ezreal, sometime fairly soon, right? Our position is okay, our hand is really lacking. Having all three chump lumps is really not so good here. So now we can talk a little bit about Karma, and how and when you should play her. Basically, don't play her before like turn 10, is kind of it. A lot of people will, on like turn 6, 7, 8, the opponent will go down to like 0 meta, and people will be like, aha, I'll play my Karma here, because then, they can't kill her this turn, so she's guaranteed to draw me a card, and then maybe they'll kill her next turn, but she'll have drawn me a card. This can be okay in some aggro matchups where you just want to survive. Don't do this against, like, don't use that kind of logic normally, though. Like, if you want her to live, then you need her to live to enlightenment, and there's not really too much of a middle ground. Like, it's very, very rare that you would play her without the ability to protect her, unless you are just in that aggro matchup and your only objective is just straight up, man, I need to survive. Okay, so we now have our chump lump on the board. We've got a couple of plays to make here. The biggest thing is our attacks are always looking fine. We're putting him on Fury of the North, right? I mean, he lost this at 20, so he only has three Fury of the North in his deck. But it's like, you kind of always assume they have it for the most part, especially when they're banking mana like this. It's a bit more likely for them to be on that trick. So, we're going to go ahead, might as well get our Vi to 10 attack here, sort of threaten it leveling up, because it does get health when it levels up. And what this should do is this should basically force a Fury of the North. This is actually pretty valuable. Like, it is so painful for him to be able to have to have to use it in a situation like this where all it's doing is basically just dealing one damage to the Vi. And we actually managed to get another decent attack. Our 4-3 Chump Lump gets to attack here. So a little bit of chip damage could even make a bit of a difference. The thing is, this deck is very defensive, but at the same time, you should place some value on your chip damage, right? Because, like, you, have, you still do have a kind of hard time killing from 20. So just getting a little bit of damage in can go a pretty long way. Now, this one's... A little awkward here. He's got the Sejuani, and we've drawn our discounted gacha, which is kind of nice, so we can do a little bit of damage, but we don't have a clean answer. Really, really would have wanted Concussive Palm, even Will would have been okay here, and so there's a lot of different things that could be done, right? So, you know, we're thinking, okay, I just need to be defensive in this position. I want to be making sure that I am staying alive and, you know, we're thinking I could play Chump Womp, I could play Karma, try to draw some cards, because I really, I need this hand to improve, so I kind of like do need to place a premium on these spell draws, even if it's random spells. Like this hand is just no good. So I decide to play Karma. And this is a cardinal mistake. Don't do this. So we just made a couple of misplays there all at once. First of all, as I mentioned, even in this extreme situation, we probably don't want to play Karma. Second of all, there's a single card in his deck that massively punishes me for playing this before combat that I just forgot about. And that card he has here. And it's Hired Gun, of course, which is just a bit of a blowout. So in general, just always kind of know your opponent's deck. And this is like my number one ladder tip. I made a video on like ladder tips and how to get to masters. Number one, literally, at the start of your game, at the very, very, very start of your game, and I'm, I'm very serious when I say this, go over to Mobilytics and literally just like find the deck you're playing against, like go by stats, right? Find the deck 
that you're playing against, like you're playing against like an Ionia Freljord, you know. So go by go by the stats. Uh, it's better to go by regions. Go by the stats on Ionia Freljord. Be like, okay, this is the one with the champions that you know. I'm I'm against the three Braum one, or I'm against the Braum deck. Let's see. This is the most popular one. Okay, and just kind of assume that this is their deck, right? If that makes sense. So, just literally pull up the opponent's deck. Do this before the mulligan. Like, just as soon as as soon as soon you see what they're running, pull up their list and just put it on the side. And make sure you're respecting all their options, right? Mobilitic Stats is a great tool for this. Because you're going to get usually a pretty good representation of what their deck is, right? So, as long as you're doing that, you're going to be in a really good position. And you'll avoid misplays like this. Where I'm normally extremely attentive about this kind of thing. Like, I do this. I always have the list up on my second monitor. But I just acted too quickly and forgot about Hired Gun in this one moment. Okay. Anyway, you know, back into it here. We've got, you know, our post-misplay game and our Karma's dead. And this is just really, really bad because now our situation is pretty bleak. And even after all this, like, notice if we draw, like, a Rummage or, like, an Ezreal, we're actually pretty all right. Like, we can still win this game. We can do a ridiculous amount of damage so fast. So, even after all this, like, even after that misplay and having bad draws um, a little bit early on, like, really needing, like, one Palm or one Ezreal to get some major, major work in this hand done, um, we're still on a chance to win. A decent chance if we just draw one good card. So, the deck can still be extremely powerful and potent, even after misplays like that. But... He's going to go ahead and sort of like ship an attack through, and unfortunately our hand is just not quite going to get there. So the rest of the game is just, you know, drawing a couple of uh, more dead cards until we sort of like can no longer win the game. Effectively, we're, we're closed out here after that misplay. I just wanted to show you guys some of the, like, some of the play patterns, some of the logic. You know, and of course, the misplay that ended up losing me the game. There was another misplay, like, sort of, like, later on that happened here, where it's just, like, at, at that point, I was, like, sort of, like, panicking, um, and, oh, yeah, I forgot. He actually, he gets a leveled up Sejuani in a really funny way here, is the other thing. But, uh, yeah, like, late, later on, we're just kind of, like, you know, sort of, like, after a couple more turns of bad draws, we end up panicking here, and sort of, like, uh delaying lethal into an efficient of a way and losing the game so not drawing ezreal and palm pretty sad but we almost certainly could have won if we had just kept our karma alive the thing is given our hand if we just keep karma alive even though our hand was bad we still should win the game like we've got mystic shots you know our gotcha can kill the sejuani with karma that's pretty stupid even just like a bunch of mushrooms plus some random top deck. And of course, if we top deck Rummage or Deep Med with Karma, it's super, super GG. Just let that be a lesson that like, even after those sort of awkward positions, you're still fine uh, if you don't misplay. And if you misplay, you can still get a draw that helps you. And this is really why I love playing this deck. Karma Ezreal is an incredibly punishing deck, but what that means is that it's also very rewarding, which is like, Almost always, there was a different play you could have done, and that is a great feeling. You feel in control, right? Even if, like, there's some things you aren't seeing, you know, you still have, you know, maybe you can ask a friend who plays Karma Ezreal, you can be like, ooh, would you have done something differently here? Because there's just so many options, and you just, yeah, you're just in control, more so than other decks. So, that's going to conclude my sort of, like, Karma Ezreal bit of a bit of a like the you know the the played games part here so yeah keep in mind of course that the deck that i was playing in these tournament games was the tournament specific version not the latter version that i would recommend that i was like you know building at the start of the video um so it was on a bit of a different list you know i wasn't running shadow assassin uh some of the ratios were a little bit different but for the most part it's still gonna play just the same so that is kind of it right? Just make sure that you are always thinking like one turn ahead, right? There were a couple of positions in those games where, especially in the early game, make sure you have five mana for the Ezreal turn, right? Like make sure that, you know, when you're attacking on three or four, save that extra two mana so that you can play the Mystic Shot for him. Because Ezreal is really a card that does cost five mana when you're attacking, 
Really keep that in mind, okay? And then just make sure that we are keeping cards like Concussive Palm in our mulligan against, honestly, pretty much every matchup. You wouldn't against like a super control deck, I guess, but this card is an auto keep in the mulligan. That's going to be really big. Unfortunately, we didn't really see it much in those games because we didn't, we, we ended up drawing it a bit later for the most part. And yeah, just make sure we are taking those passes. That's the number one thing that's going to help you be better than anyone else at Karma Azrael who isn't. You'll win so many games by doing that. And yeah, that's my guide for the time being. <coughs> Yone's a super busted card right now, so abuse the shit out of this guy. And yep, that's Karma Ezreal in a nutshell. So this has been somewhat of like, you know, I, I, fairly basic. Like I, I haven't gone into like incredibly advanced stuff. Um, but this should take you very far on the deck. All right, let me know if you're interested in like more of this kind of guide. Uh, kind of going over like tournament games and stuff like that because I might end up doing one for the Swain Brown deck as well Which was also a little bit particular. All right boys. That's gonna be it for me. See you guys next time